<laughs> Alright. Well, last time we kind of stopped right in the middle of Isaiah. That's because the video was going a little long, and I really don't like them to get up into the 40s. Um, so, yeah, that takes us to the Little Apocalypse in chapter 24 through 27. Why it's called the Little Apocalypse is because you're just reading through Isaiah, and then out of nowhere you have this apocalyptic literature. That's, you know, three chapters. Well, four, technically, because 24, 25, 26, 27. So, uh, four chapters that, that, that just talk about this stuff. Now, it, it mentions something called the Leviathan. And many people have given many different um, different ideas. And it, honestly, it's not that they're all bad. It's just all of the different ideas usually have to do with understanding things in current context. Um, and... and, and it, it's very unwise to assume that you have the answer to prophecy. I mean, prophecy is, is no, there's some parts of prophecy that are not knowable until after the events. Um, for instance, everybody you know knew about the things of the, the signs of the Messiah, and then the Messiah comes, and they're like, "Yeah, you don't match the description. You know, he didn't match match the description of what they wanted." See. Um, and so it's best to understand the Levi Leviathan as a symbol of evil, not as a specific nation or people or person or whatever. It's best to just notice it as a symbol of evil. Um, if you want more on that, uh, you can you know do research on it. But keep in mind that a lot of things sound real good, but they have no biblical basis. So then it takes us to the Oracles of Woe in chapter 28 all the way through 33. Um, Ephraim is mentioned there in 28.1. Uh, it says, Woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim, and to the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley of those who are overcome with wine. So once again, talking in a large deal about Israel, but then also specifically talking about one area of Israel. Um, so so it's kind of interesting to note that. Um, once again, remember that that, that, that part was, was very fertile. Um, Ariel is mentioned in 21, 29, 1 through 4. Woe, O Ariel, Ariel, the city where David once camped. Ariel means earth of God, hearth of God. Um, it's Jerusalem. Um, so uh, we see Jerusalem established throughout prophecy as a sacred found uh, as sacred. It is a foundation of peace, and its name Salem is peace. Okay, um, uh, I believe um, Hebrews talks about this uh, with the with the. It's it's kind of, I'm kind of drawing a blank now, but I think I recall. Um, yeah, Hebrews talks about this. It talks about King Melchizedek and, and Salem. Well, Salem became Jerusalem. Um, it mentions Salem in, in, in Genesis. Um, and, and, you know, it's just a city then, but then it becomes Jerusalem when, when, when Israel takes it over. So, um, Zion becomes also a symbol as well. Um, so Zion can mean Jerusalem, it can mean Judah, it can mean God's people as a whole, it can mean um, the heavenly... You know, thing going on. Mount Zion can be the Temple Mount. It can be God's dwelling place. It can, I mean, honestly, it can be so many different things. And context has to guide um, and guide on this one as well. So Jerusalem, Zion, Mount Zion, they become images. The same as Egypt becomes a sign, a, a symbol um, of, of you know, being tempted, something that that, that seems pleasurable. Um, and this is played off of in the New Testament, um, especially in Hebrews when he talks about Moses leaving the pleasures of Egypt. Um, the, the same as that, and in Babylon, obviously, becomes a symbol of evil and everything. This, in the same way, Jerusalem and Zion and Mount Zion become symbols. But they aren't always allegory, okay? Once again, just because something can be allegory once doesn't mean that it always is. Um, once again, with Christianity, we tend to go to extremism. And oftentimes, there's a nice balance right there in the middle. Um, so, anyways, um, that takes us to... Um, uh, in chapter um, 30, verses 1 through 5, it talks about Egypt. Now, Egypt had moments of strength, but ultimately they had pretty much lost power status by this time. Um, they, they were known, however, for their unfulfilled promises. Um, the, oh, no, we'll be there, and then, you know, they aren't. Um, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the safety of Pharaoh will be your shame, and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt, your humiliation. Um, goes on talking about that in uh, verse, that I think I read 2 through 3. Um, so the end time summation in chapter 34 through 35. Edom was mentioned once again, that's Esau in 34, 6. 
and all the hosts of heaven will wear away, and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts will also uh, wither away as a leaf withers from the vine. I'm sorry, I think that's Genesis 34 or 6. Let me see. No. Um, I don't know what I was getting with that. With the fa the sword of the Lord is is filled with blood. Oh, oh, I was reading the wrong verse. I'm sorry. It is sated with with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. So, uh, that is that is of the land of Edom. You can learn more about that. Um, Carmel and Sharon is mentioned in, in chapter 35. They were the richest areas. And so a lot of times he'll draw a contrast saying, oh, th this, this place will be deserty. It says, and the Rabba will rejoice and blossom. The Rabba is a desert. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's drawing a contrast there that Carmel and Sharon, which is known as the, as the richest areas, the fertile areas, they're going to be desolate while the desert is going to be blooming. Um, so um, to that, we, it takes us to a historical interlude from th chapter 36 all the way through chapter 39, which is talked about in the books of Kings as well. It covers um, Sennacherib's inv invasion. It talks about uh, King Ma Hezekiah's illness. It talks about uh, King Manasseh. And it talks about Babylon. Um, the, 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 that, that Babylon would um, you know, come back. Um, as mentioned in 2 Kings 18, 1-21. Um, and, you know, they did come back. They did remember. So it, it's kind of important to note that the books of Kings probably used Isaiah as a source. Um, the two accounts are pretty similar. Um, in chapter 40, comfort my people. Chapter 41, coming deliverance. Chapter 42, the role of the Lord's servant. Um, Christ is compared with Israel in 42, 18-25. Um, hear you deaf, and look you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or so deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is so blind as he that is at peace with me, or so blind um, as a servant of the Lord? Um, so a lot of illusions. Not illusions, but illusions. Um, so. That takes us to Israel's redemption against Babylon, chapter 43 through 45, before Babylon had even risen to power, once again. Uh, Cyrus is mentioned by name, and he was going to be the people who over. He was going to be the king who overthrew Babylon. So we're talking about two kingdoms forward um, of Persia. So it was Assyria came to power, then Babylon was in power for a very short time, then Persia was in power, but then eventually they fell to Alexander the Great. But we'll get into that into the New Testament class. Um, so Babylon becomes a symbol of evil. Um, for instance, Rome was often associated with Babylon, uh, the Tower of Babel, Babylon. So. Um, and at the end of chapter 44 and, and uh, beginning of chapter five, 45, and it talks about him. Um, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he, will, he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Thus, thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him, and to lose the lo loose the loins of kings to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. Um, First off, it seems as though the gates of Babylon were just simply opened up when Persia came to conquer them. Uh, we'll get into that later uh, in the post-exile uh, lessons. Um, but um, it's it, it's talking about there about about Cyrus and it mentions about building up the temple. Uh, he's the one who allowed the Israelites to go back to build Judah um, or the temple in Judah. Um, so judgment against Babylon, chapter 46 through 47. Israel's release and exaltation of 48 through 52. Suffering servant, again in 52 through 53. And celebrating the return, chapter 54 through 59. Um, now, if you notice, I'll, I'll read it first. 54, 1 through 3. Shout for joy, O barren one. You who have borne no child, break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. Uh, for the sons of the desolate uh, one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. So you have a complete switch here. You have a good land with many people and blessings. Um, just a total change of, of, of scenario from what, what he said was going to happen. So uh, 
I'm sure righteous is not a show it is is one of the aspects here in 58 he talks about uh, the fasting and he, and, he, and he's not saying that fasting is bad but he's talking about truly being righteous not putting on a show not missing the point of the thing for the thing itself for instance uh, the Pharisees did this with, with the, um, uh, the Sabbath day oh they're not supposed to be working at all well once again um, the Sabbath was not a day to do nothing it was a day to worship the Lord and um, it wasn't about what they were doing with their actions so much as what they were doing with their heart. Uh, but the Pharisees overlooked that. Um, so the climax of God's restoration in chapter 60 through 66. Uh, Have Ziba and Beulah are mentioned in 62, 1 through 9. I'll look at that right quick. Um, for Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not keep quiet. Until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning, the nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will designate. You will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. It will no longer be said to you forsaken nor to your land. It will, will it any longer be said desolate. You will be called my delight is in her, which is uh, uh, Hevziba, and your land married, which is Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and to him you land will be married. Um, so once again, uh, some of the some of the translations translate it for you. Um, some of them leave it as Hebzeb and Beulah. If you have one of the translations that leaves it as Hebzeb and Beulah, that's what it means. Um, my delight is in her, Hebzeb, and married Beulah. So uh, that takes us to the end of Isaiah. I know I blew through that very quickly. You could spend weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on uh, Isaiah and still have a lot to go over. So um, that takes us to the prophet Micah, not Malachi, Micah. Um, Micah was a prophet uh, to both Judah and Israel, and he prophesied between about 737 to about 690. Um, and uh, it, it's very important to note this. He did not enjoy it. In, in chapters 8 through 9, for instance, I'm sorry, I think this is 1, 8 through 9, but let me double check. Yeah, 1, 8 through 9. It says, Because of this, I must lament and well, I must go barefoot and naked. I must make a lament like the jackals and a mourning like the ostriches. So it says there, 8, 8 through 9, that's chapter 1, 8 through 9. I don't know why the 1, sometimes when I'm typing, I you know, either forget something or I go to change something, I forget to fix it, or I hit something with my finger and it goes and, and writes over it, or different things like that. Uh, but anyways... Um, so he did not enjoy it. It was not he, like he was sitting there waiting to give a message of condemnation. Um, and in fact, that's a key theme for a lot of, uh, of the people who actually have God's words rather than their own words. Is a lot of times they don't like it. God's people are frequently called to live in areas that they don't like to minister to people that don't listen to them or that they don't like uh, in situations that, that irritate them. Um, social injustice is a major, major, major key. Two picks up. Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it, for it is in the power of their hands. Um, three picks up. And I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the houses of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? And then six picks up again. Uh, and with what w and with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God of High? Shall I come to Him with burnt offerings with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand uh, rivers of oil? Um, so once again, talking about the social injustice. And as Christians, we should be involved uh, to a de to a good degree uh, of, of of you know standing up for for the people who don't have voices for themselves. You know the 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 widow, the orphan, the 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 boarded. We should be standing up for these people because it's the right thing to do. Um, so social injustice. This is a key theme. Ugh. And, um, I can't remember if that's all I was going to say about that. Uh, encouragement uh, is something else that he, that he really goes on about for. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the peoples will string to it. Um, and then in verses 11-13, and now many nations have been assembled against you who say, Let her be polluted, and let our eyes gloat over Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, and they do not understand his purpose. For he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Um, the outline, very simple. 
First round of judgment and salvation, chapter 1 through 5. Second round of judgment and salvation, chapter 6 through 7. The message warned Judah and Israel of judgment so they could hear and repent. Israel's fall was swift. Hezekiah's reign postponed destruction. Um, and I, Josh, Joash kind of did too. Um, so we're almost to the end of this, this section. We're going to be talking about Proverbs, and that, that will finish up this section. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the book of Proverbs, and, and so I hope to kind of clarify that. Um, first off, it was written by, by Solomon or, you know, uh, in a large deal by Solomon. But it was, it was later comp compiled and edited by King Hezekiah, as well as possibly um, some others. Uh, but keep in mind that, that just because it's Proverbs doesn't mean that it is not it is man's insight. It is revealed by God. It is still inspired by the Lord, still profitable for, for teaching. Um, so what is a proverb? A proverb is a principle proven true, generally. Most of the time, this is true. It's not saying this is a, as you say there, it's not a promise, it's not a command. It's a principle that most of the time is true, as proven by experience. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue, uh, see what I mean? Uh, is that generally true? Yes. That is a principle that has been proven true over time. Try it. Next time there, there, there's, there's disunity and discord, stir it up. Next time you're at a family gathering and you have a family fight, uh, open your mouth real wide and, and shoot off something stupid and see what happens. Or give a gentle answer. See what happens. Um, you husbands and wives, that you could learn the same thing there too. Um, so it's not promises. 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, there's a lot of Christian parents who take this in despair. You know, sometimes it is your fault. Sometimes it's not your fault. <laughs> but remember that it is still their choice for the decisions that they make, and it's not a, it's not a promise that no matter what they will they do still need to find their own way to the Lord. You know, we as Christian parents sometimes just take for granted that our kids are going to be saved rather than witnessing to them and, and, and being an example for them. Um, so there are also not commands. Twenty two twenty four through twenty six five says, "Do not associate with a man given to anger, or, or go with a hot tempered man, or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself." Um, now, obviously, first off, it's talking about close association, not just talking with somebody. They're talking about being close friends. Second off, um, it's also not talking about witnessing. Okay, it's talking about generally speaking. Um, if you hang out with people who are hot tempered, you will be hot tempered. You you are what you eat is one way of saying it. You uh, birds of a feather flock together. You know, um, bad company corrupts. I mean, you could say it in 15 different ways. But at the end of the day, it, it, we are very much a product of environment. Um, and so we need to be careful about that. Um, Proverbs is about practical, how to live righteous, very practical. Um, 21, 20, verse 1. Uh, wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. See, it's talking about, uh, think practically about this. Set aside religion for a second and think practically. Okay? Is it wise to get drunk where you don't remember what you did? No. Because you don't remember what you did. You could do something dumb. You wake up the next day, your eyes are bloodshot, you have a headache. Well, was that smart? No, that's not smart. That's torturing yourself. So it's just how to live righteous. But then also there's a religious aspect. It ties in the fact that um, your mind and your spirit are supposed to work together. In Christianity, we kind of just drop off our brain because we're afraid that something's going to disprove our, our Bible or something. You know, we just we go to this extreme of just turning off our brains. Or... Uh, we think that to be smart, you have to give up being faith and being and living by faith. And the and proverb shows us that the two go together. Walk by faith, but live wisely. See what I mean? There is there is a middle ground there. Um, yeah, so wisdom, and I've written a blog about this, is submitting to discipline and fearing the Lord. If you fear the Lord, you will um, you you will live righteous because you have someone to answer to. You fear the Lord. That's a basis for, for moral living. If you do not fear the Lord, there's no basis for your moral living. Um, and so submitting to discipline, obviously, that's wisdom. When somebody says something and you learn from it. So. Um, that takes us to a general outline. Um of Proverbs. 
Uh, first off, the prologue in chapter 1, 1 through 8. Uh, opponents of wisdom in, in 1, 8 through 9, 18. Now remember, pay attention when it says about parents and that kind of stuff. Solomon's Proverbs are from 10 to 22, 16, and then sayings of the wise from 22, 17 to 24, 34. Then Hezekiah's edition of more of Solomon's teachings are from 25 to 29. Sings of Agur and Lemuel, whoever the heck they are, from 30 through 31, 9. And then it has this little postscript about the excellent wife in chapter 31, 10 through 31. So, um, obviously if you're a leader, you should be reading Proverbs. Um, it talks about pride and it talks about laziness. It talks about the wicked person who's prideful and, and, and is lazy and, and is and that kind of idea. Then it talks about the righteous person who's wise. Who's, who, who fears the Lord, who's disciplined. You know, it just drives this, this strong contrast. Um, so as I said, mind plus religion equals wisdom. Um, Proverbs 1, 28-29 says, um, Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me, because they hated knowledge and, because, uh, and they did not choose the fear of the Lord. So, um, that is the end of this section. Next lesson will be about the exile, the time of the exile. And that, when I say the exile, I mean all the way from Israel's exile in 722 to um, the end of Judah's exile in, you know, five, whenever the heck they returned. I can't remember right now, um, but 530 something I want to say. Or, uh, it's, I'm drawing a blank. Well, anyways, they were exiled in 586, so. Um, but anyways. Um, I, I hope that this was this was profitable for you and that you learned something. Um, as I said, next lesson will be about the exile.